Good morning, everybody. Glad to be with you today. The holidays are over, officially. I can bear witness to that. Uh, this week was whew, a whirlwind, but uh, we've had a, a few disruptions over the last uh, few Sundays. Uh, Holidays, of course, uh, Dr. Lilback being in town, but we're ready to get back in the swing of things. And so we're back in the Gospel of Luke. So I ask you to turn to Luke chapter 9. Uh, it ought not be too difficult to pick up where we left off, because where we left off last time was the transfiguration of Jesus uh, on this unknown mountaintop in Galilee. Uh, with Peter, James, and John. Uh, Jesus had told his disciples beforehand, remember, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And soon those three disciples uh, witnessed it in all its glory. Uh, the Lord transfigured in glorious light in their presence and the appearance of Moses and Elijah conversing with him, as I said in our previous lesson, it was an, a fantastic and unsurpassable uh, privilege. And Peter would years later uh, refer back to it in his uh, second epistle in 2 Peter uh, 1 verses 16 and following that we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It was for Peter and the two other disciples, the quintessential uh, mountaintop experience, uh, but they soon came back to earth as we read in our passage now. So we're gonna read verses 37 through 50. It's quite a lengthy passage and I'm gonna try to make our way through it, but let's begin with verse 37 on the next day. When they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples uh, to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. And while he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. For the son of man, I think we're supposed to get the idea here that he somehow took the disciples aside. So uh, and the emphasis is on the you. Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this statement. An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. Can you imagine? <laughs> Never fails to amaze me. Uh, but Jesus, uh, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. John answered, 
and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, do not bother him, for he who is not against you is for you. Perhaps some of you have experienced uh, yourselves in your Christian life, uh, something approaching a mountaintop experience like the three disciples did on the Mount of Transfiguration, this energized state of mind and heart that it's often young believers find themselves in after a particularly uplifting spiritual experience, the experience uh, perhaps of being fed God's word intently over a condensed period of time and, and given that set apart uh, time for the Holy Spirit to enlarge our vision of our great God, of who he is and what he has done for us, leading to the kind of feeling that that spiritual high uh, is going to last uh, forever and our lives would be forever different. And that we would from that point forward live our lives in the unending glow of that spiritual experience. But alas, uh, we have not yet uh, fully arrived at that place. I've titled our lesson, uh, From Glory Above to Striving Below. We are still below, aren't we? Uh, where the disciples uh, soon found themselves. In Luke's account, he very quickly makes us aware of that. Verse 37 reads, on the next day, meaning the day following the transfiguration, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. Now, coming out of this uh, generally joyous football bowl season, uh, large crowds are, are typically uh, quite welcomed. But in the Bible, they're very much a mixed bag. In the present case, it was not mixed at all. Their appearance was indicative of trouble. When we study the Gospels, as we have the privilege to, to do here. Uh, they are, of course, full of wondrous truth, but they're also quite interesting in what is known as the harmonization of, of the Gospels, uh, how they all fit together. That is, each of the four has both uh, similarities and distinctions from the others. In our case here, uh, both Matthew and Mark record these same events, the transfiguration and the events of which we have just read. But Luke's version is very interesting, uh, omits <clears throat> much of the activity and conversation that came in between as set forth by Matthew and Mark. He, he's carefully and intentionally edited the material in order to bring his readers, you and I, quickly down from the mountain with Jesus and the three disciples to the earthly reality with the other disciples. And they're below. And Luke captures that here in the passage we just read by relating four incidents that highlight the disciples' failures, a failure of faith, a dimness of understanding about Christ and his coming, a prideful self-advancement, and misguided partisanship. But first, we have this desperate scene with the boy with the seizures. It's a terrible contrast with what came before. Uh, commentators on the Gospel of Luke often reference here the masterful a final painting of uh, the Renaissance artist Raphael uh, entitled The Transfiguration. And some of you are familiar with that painting, uh, remembering it for its beauty, but also for the poignant expression that painting gives of the two episodes Luke consecutively uh, narrates. At the top of the canvas, there is uh, Jesus transfigured and seemingly uh, floating in a white cloud with Moses and Elijah suspended on either side of him and the three disciples uh, sprawled out on uh, the ground uh, beneath him. 
uh, the radiant white glow of the cloud illumines that scene, the top part of the paint, painting, while below the atmosphere is much darker. Uh, below is pictured the melee uh, surrounding the epileptic boy and his distressed father with the distraught other disciples looking perplexed and, and frustrated and one of them even pointing up to the mountaintop as if to say, there is your only hope. It captures the situation we see in the passage, glory above, chaos below. And out of the crowd, one man's outcry takes center stage. Teacher, I beg you, look at my son, for he is my only uh, boy. The, the action he requests, having more of the sense to look upon, not just look, but to look upon, to look with com compassion. The situation was desperate, uh, even more so in the ancient world, uh, because he only had one uh, son. And the description he gives of the boy's condition has caused many to conjecture that he <clears throat> suffered from epilepsy. Uh, ep epilepsy is a malady that uh, we find mentioned in uh, the Bible. And uh, Matthew 24, 24 describes how epileptics were being <clears throat> brought to Jesus uh, for healing. That may have been the case here, but it was more than that because Luke leaves no doubt that the boy's experience was brought about by demonic forces. Uh, the, the father describes it as a spirit seizing him, uh, but Luke in verse 42 states plainly that it was a demon who slammed the boy into the ground and threw him into a convulsion. And this had apparently been going on for some time uh, the demon's oppression had, according to Mark's version, uh, made him into a deaf mute uh, and subjected him to the constant danger of falling into a fire or falling into water where he could drown and to the humiliation of uncontrollable wailing and foaming at the mouth. It was a horrible uh, condition. And it was as Jesus and the three disciples were coming down from the mountain that they met up with this scene. And we know from both here in verse 40 and again from Mark's gospel that the nine other disciples were in the thick of it. The father had brought the son to them, uh, perhaps having heard of the success the disciples had had on their teaching and, and, and healing tour. We read about it earlier in this chapter. Uh, they had gone about preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. He may have heard about that. But they failed miserably uh, here. Uh, and Mark describes how the opportunistic and antagonistic scribes uh, had joined the fray and they were ridiculing Jesus' disciples and arguing with them. You know that scene why they had been unable uh, to help this man uh, as they had helped others before is not explained explicitly, but it becomes apparent in the subsequent rebuke of the Lord. There, there had been a faltering of faith. It was unbelief that explained their failure and likely a lapse into overconfidence in their own abilities. Uh, Mark, <clears throat> again, in, in his gospel in chapter 9 and verses 28 and 29, describes <clears throat> how the disciples themselves were at a loss over their inability to help. Why could we not drive out the demon, they asked Jesus. And he answered them, uh, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. There's a little thing called prayer. <laughs> and the disciples had somehow undertaken the task of becoming miracle workers for the day without availing themselves of prayer, if you can believe that. And, and what is prayer but communion with God, uh, the only one who can empower weak and sinful beings to do the great things he has for them to do. And prayer is an expression, if you think about it, of uh, faith, 
of humility and uh, of the necessity of God's grace and empowerment in order to accomplish anything uh, worthy or pleasing uh, to God. And so the disciples had allowed themselves to take confidence in past triumphs and forgotten the one thing that had made those triumphs a possible, divine enablement. And they had fallen flat on their faces in the pro process. It was a public and humiliating failure, a disgrace to their master, and led to the pleasant, present, situ unpleasant scene. This situation was an unholy mess. And I would venture to guess that you, like me, have made unholy messes in our lives before by failing uh, to pray. And Jesus responds when the father uh, laments, I begged your disciples to cast it out. He begged them. He had, when I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not, uh, the Lord in, in seeming anguish unloaded on them all in frustration. You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. And every time I read this, uh, it makes me pause. But coming from my Lord, I think it's because if the same words came out of my mouth, they would re reflect petulance and, and arrogance on my part. But coming out of the Lord's mouth, uh, there would have been none of that. Uh, just as when at Lazarus's tomb, Jesus wept and his weeping was over not just Lazarus, but over the whole lot of misery sin had given birth to, ending in the tragedy of death. So here his rebuke reflected <clears throat> a disheartened soul. Disheartened, not just with the nine disciples, but with the entire generation of those he had come to, uh, represented by his disciples uh, and the scribes and the crowds he had been encountering throughout his ministry. And so here, I think we must see Jesus uh, as, he, as he was, transfigured, but now appearing on the scene, as one of the commentators put it, like a visitor from another world who has to put up with the unbelief of men. He exhibits the poignant sorrow of his disappointment at their unbelief. What Edersheim described as the almost home longing of his soul, uh, the loneliness and the anguish of one who must feel as if he is the only one who truly does believe in a world that only expressed unbelief and a total lack of faith. You know, there had been a series of disappointments with his disciples. Uh, the Gospels record them. I'm going to read you some excerpts from different places. Uh, these disappointments in, in which Jesus variously was grieved. He sighed deeply in his spirit. He was utterly astonished at their hardened hearts. But he's not deterred from his determination to serve them now against the unbelief of men he authoritatively commands that the man's son be brought to him. And that seemed to trigger in uh, the demon in verse 42, a last ditch determination to do as much damage as possible while it was still able. As they brought the boy forward, it slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. Now, slammed is a good translation of this Greek verb that was often used of boxers uh, giving knockout blows. The demon threw a roundhouse blow at this helpless child. Who or what would do such a thing? Uh, only a being evil to the core 
And so with its fate sealed by Jesus' command to bring the boy near, the spirit uh, puts on display Satan's true colors, fully intending to destroy the little child. But then Jesus did what he habitually did, and, and he still does today. Uh, with great compassion, he rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the boy. He gave him back to uh, his father. And rebuked by the Lord, the demon had no other recourse than to slip away, uh, no power to do any further damage. And, uh, but the real story was the healing of the son and his return to his father, whole and healthy. The Lord was no mere miracle uh, worker. He was a restorer of lives, just like he's been a restorer of your life and, uh, and of my life. Uh, driving out misery and strife and replacing it with joy. In the onlooking crowd, Luke records in verse 43, we're all amazed at the greatness of God. A more precise translation uh, might render that the grandeur of God, or better, the majesty of God. You know, greatness can be an overused word, and we use it in trite ways to describe trite uh, things. Uh, but majesty uh, befits that which is divine. And what the Lord put on display was not just great, it was, it was sublime. It reflected the kind of regard that belongs only to deity, which was never far from his heart, he had not come to attract attention to himself so much as to bring glory to his father. Uh, we see that over and over again in what he says in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of, of John. And now in this <clears throat> stunned aftermath of this healing, uh, the majesty that had been visible only to the three privileged disciples on the mount above was now visible to a greater number uh, here down below, and it's the majesty the Lord desires we see in the numberless miracles he performs in and among us, prayers of healing answered. We heard one last Sunday in the auditorium. Uh, lives changed, uh, relationships restored, families reunited, financial stability uh, recovered, and we behold God's uh, majesty whenever we hear his word opened up, whether it's in this building uh, in the, when the pulpit is, is filled or it may be in a, um, a, a, a small group Bible study or it may be in a, a prayer meeting, uh, even in the privacy of that time in the morning or the evening or whenever it is when you're alone with the Lord and the Bible's in front of you. Uh, we, we, we see that uh, majesty. God reveals his majesty to us if we'll only apply the faith he's given us to see it and be amazed at it, as this crowd this day was. Now we know for some that day, perhaps most of them, it was not the marveling of true faith that got them stirred, but only the giddy excitement of a spectacular display. That, that would become more and more apparent in a short period of time. In the meantime, uh, the Lord had special designs on his 12 disciples, and Luke describes deftly now the careful attention he pays to them. They are distinguished uh, first in verse 43 uh, from the simply wondering crowds, and <clears throat> though the English versions don't explicitly make it clear in verse 44, the special attention to them is reinforced with an emphatic you. You know, because you've heard it before in this language, uh, it's built in such a way that the order of the words, the sequence of the words can uh, give emphasis, and so you receives an emphatic place in what Jesus said. And so one version translates it for, for, you, for your part, you for your part. I'm calling it correcting the focus. For your part, 
let what I am to say now sink into the ears. In other words, don't let it pass through one ear, as we say, through one ear and out the other, but let it roll around your head and let it percolate there. And then <clears throat> follows what is now the second prediction the Lord makes of his passion. The first we saw earlier in this chapter 9 in verse 22 when he uh, told the disciples, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. That's just one page over in, in my Bible. But here in verse 44, <clears throat> he adds to that, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. And we know that to be true uh, because these Gospels are not new uh, to us. We've read them. We know it to be true. While the leaders of the Jews uh, did reject Jesus and, and played a, a major role in sending him to the cross, they could not have arranged to have him crucified by themselves. They needed uh, help. They were not able to do that. And so first Judas delivered Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. And then the Sanhedrin, the council of the Jews, uh, conspired together, <coughs> uh, finagled things with Pilate so that Pilate was the one that would, would crucify, have the Lord crucified. And that's probably what Jesus was indicating here. Uh, but it's also true, we should note this, because it's absolutely true and it's profound, that ultimately he was to be delivered over to the Gentiles by his own father. Uh, Paul, the apostle, would assert that in, in Romans 4.25. Uh, he described Jesus as being delivered over because of our transgressions. If he was delivered over because of our transgressions, who would have done the delivering? And likewise, he wrote in Romans 8.32, this familiar verse, that God did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Paul was probably inspired by that, that final <clears throat> stanza, strophe of, of Isaiah 53, verse 10. Uh, in which uh, Isaiah describes how the Lord was pleased to crush his servant, putting him to grief. The Lord was pleased to do that. Whatever the exact intent of his words, they went straight over the disciples' uh, heads. Luke says they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this statement. The disciples had their own preconceived notions of what Messiah would be like when he came. That's a certainty. They remained in the dark until the very end. But clearly, that was not <clears throat> the entire explanation for their lack of understanding the Lord's uh, words. And Luke describes it, note, note, note in, in the passage, as being hidden uh, from them. The thought is expressed in, in the passive sense. It was hidden from them, indicating that someone outside uh, the 12 was concealing it from them. The, the language further indicating that the purpose of the concealing, it's, it, it's, it's in the verse, the purpose of the concealing was precisely so that they would not perceive it, so that they would not perceive it. Who would have done that? Who would have been capable of it. There's only one possible answer. Uh, the same one who was to deliver the son into the hands of men would logically, in the flow of his words to them, be the one who concealed it, uh, the father of the son of man. And as to why he would conceal it, we can only speculate. Uh, Jesus' uh, off-repeated uh, declaration <clears throat> that his hour had not yet come could lead us to believe that it was the timing uh, he was concerned about. And, and so in concert with what uh, the father, if, with that, the father concealed it from the disciples, uh, the, the, the true understanding of Jesus's predictions. But the time was drawing near. 
<clears throat> this is important for us to, to note in our study of the gospel. The time was drawing near. The very next verse after this passage, you can see it there in verse 51, <clears throat> uh, provides the clue. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. The timing was critical. Jerusalem, the deadly destination, and the triune God was in control of all of it. But in any event, uh, the disciples did not seem to want to understand, perhaps like we all often do, uh, I think you can identify with this, that they'd rather avoid unpleasant news. And so uh, Luke explains at the end of verse 45, they were afraid, afraid to ask him about this statement. But their dullness of understanding may also have been due to even less flattering reasons. Uh, we see that as we arrive at verse 46, and now their third great failure. Jesus had just uh, spoken to them of his sacrificial death for sinners. I thought they did not understand because they could not fathom such a thing. And now we read an argument uh, started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. And the contrast, of course, is, is jolting. Uh, Jesus had his heart and mind set on love for others, uh, the disciples on individual aggrandizement. Uh, one's focus was self-sacrifice, uh, the other's self-advancement. They would not, of course, had, had broken into this train of conversation had Jesus been within earshot as they walked along the way. And so, as I said earlier, somehow they'd become uh, separated. But Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. Luke uh, tells us he, he either knew it intuitively or perhaps his divine nature informed his human uh, nature. But he would not let it stand, so he found a willing child along uh, the way and brought the child over to the others. In the Gospels, you know, Jesus is unfailingly seen as a faithful friend and confidant of children. He loved uh, children. He liked my wife. He loved children, and he loved to be in their company. Nobody can have a conversation with a child like Cindy can. It's amazing, but I don't have much to say to him, really. But she does. But Jesus was like that. Uh, he loved children, and here we can partly see why. In, in this case, the child served as an object lesson for the Lord as, as he took the child and, and stood him by his side, saying, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. This is the one who is great. Now, we've heard this before, but it's still something that is difficult to, to, to really get a hold of. This is the one who is great, the one who is, is least. Children were accorded little honor or importance in the world of the disciples, but when Jesus took this child and stood him beside himself, he distinguished uh, the child. The child immediately, by virtue of that, gained a stature he had not had before. The child had not sought out this distinction. He was just playing on the side of the road. Uh, that, that's part of Jesus' point. For as long as men and women have lived on this earth, the desire for greatness and admiration for advancement ahead of others has been the bane of our existence. But the child represented one who had no such illusions as that. And likewise, there was nothing to be gained, nothing to be gained by showing special attention to him, but for those who would receive such a child in the name of Jesus, they reveal their regard for Jesus himself. That is, if, if they would but love and respect such a lowly one for the very reason that it is God's nature to accept such, they are in essence serving Jesus himself. And in serving Jesus, 
They're serving the one who sent him. The Lord very simply in, the, in this disappointing interaction with the disciples is encouraging them to be like him and not like the world. He is the one who came not to be served, but to serve and, and to give his life for others. That's true greatness. It comes through service to others. I know people uh, like this, don't you? They're not constantly trying to advance themselves or impress others. They notice the lowly. They see the friendless. They see the person standing alone in the hall, clearly not knowing anybody. They see the person come in dressed a little shabbier than some of us and they go to them. Their agenda is Christ's agenda. They don't rush to greet the eminent or the beautiful or the important. They are the great among us. And I know there is a desire hidden in our hearts to be great. <laughs> there is that desire, but there's a pure greatness that we can desire, and that's it. Find, find the downtrodden. Find those who are not and make them somebody. The last failure of the disciples mentioned here by Luke in this section of the gospel is what I called earlier misguided partisanship. It's brought to us by John, surprisingly. You would think this would be Peter. Maybe Luke got it messed up. Joe, that's not kidding, not serious, but uh, he, it's, it's brought up by John who uh, possibly just wants to change the subject a bit by suddenly bringing up an, an unknown man often labeled the strange exorcist. And what led him to raise the, the topic, the subject, is not entirely clear, but it was definitely in answer to Jesus' pronouncement about receiving the least, because that's what Luke says. He answered Jesus by relating to him how they had run into someone who was casting out demons in Jesus' name, and they tried to prevent him because he wasn't part of their group. He had appeared as an outsider uh, to them. Perhaps John was... Uh, testing the limits of Jesus' exhortation toward kindness to others. You know, should, should, the, should we have been kind to him? Maybe that's what John had in mind. Or it may have been that he was simply you know, trying to regain the upper hand here by casting himself and the others in a favor, favorable light. You know, back on the top again. <laughs> we're, we're, we're back in your good graces. This is what we did. But, but the man apparently was meeting with success in his exorcisms, and he was admittedly for John casting out the demons in Christ's name. What had bothered John and the others was that he was not part of their group. And because of that, there arose the spirit of rivalry. He was treading on their turf. And what John was suggesting was that if he was going to engage in a ministry for Christ, he would need to do it under their auspices. It was an exclusivistic, if there is such a word, it was an exclusivistic way of thinking, a kind of intolerance of the work of one not part of his own group. And and the most natural thing to think for those of us who are convinced that we have a lock on how things uh, ought to be done. But Jesus took the opposite approach. Do not hinder him, he said, for he who is not against you is for you. And that's the important lesson here, I think, for those like us, like me, who, who do actually think we're advancing the ministry in a way that is pleasing to the head of our church, that we must not let misguided partisanship dampen our enthusiasm and our prayers for those who are not against Christ, but they're for him. Well, there are numerous lessons uh, in this rather uh, long passage we've studied this morning. Uh, 
And I'm gonna conclude by just identifying the primary one. The primary one that uh, I had hoped the title to the lesson conveyed from glory above to striving below, there is a never ending tendency for things to get a little messy down here. It's just, it's just the way it works. Uh, battles continually rage and the slow and painful process, as Charles Hodge put it years ago in his commentary on the epistle to the Romans, of putting to death the deeds of the flesh is one that we engage in every moment. But we don't fight these battles in our own strength. You know what your battles are. They're different than mine probably, but similar but we don't fight them in our own strength. It's by God's Holy Spirit that we have success. And when we trust in Him alone and make it our aim to please Him alone, we can experience in our own lives that foretaste of the grandeur of our Savior that led Peter to say he had been an eyewitness to His majesty. Like the perplexed a disciple in Raphael's a painting ensnared by the frustrating confrontation with the father of this possessed son and with the contentious uh, scribes uh, baying at him, but who is portrayed as pointing up above to the glorified Christ. The lesson is there is our only hope. And so we say, as Paul the apostle wrote in Colossians 3, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's close. Father, thank you for uh, the example that these poor disciples have given us. Uh, we're grateful for we see ourselves in, uh, in them, uh, but we're especially thankful for uh, the display of majesty that the Lord Jesus provided, not necessarily in the transfiguration, but in uh, his words, in his deeds, in his patience, in his love, in his condescension. May we be like him. May we uh, spend much more time uh, thinking about the things above and focusing on him. We pray in his name, amen.